Good afternoon, everybody. Um, again, my name is Jason Henderson, Associate Professor, Turf Grass and Soil Sciences, uh, University of Connecticut. Uh, I did not pick this title, uh, but I did give it a subtitle. Uh, it's a little bit misleading, so it is not autonomous. Uh, but it doesn't mean uh, this technology couldn't be adapted for autonomous uh, mowers in the future. Um, <clears throat> uh, in Connecticut, um, we uh, had a ban in, on pesticides pre-K through eighth grade uh, starting in 2010. Um, this was obviously very disruptive for our turf grass managers in maintaining safe playing surfaces. A uh, very similar law in the state of New York, uh, but it banned it all the way pre-K through high school. Um, so this is, again, very challenging for many of our um, uh, field managers in maintaining those safe playing surfaces. Um, and I'll, I'll share uh, next slide how that's expanded, uh, not necessarily all out bans, but uh, severe restrictions. Uh, but we're still, uh, when it comes to these types of bans restrictions behind other parts of the country like Canada and certainly Europe and so certainly some of the uh, countries uh, you guys are from. So uh, I put this together to show where some of these more res severe restrictions are. Uh, certainly Connecticut and, and New York are dealing with them. Uh, but you can see how it's uh, around some more uh, progressive states near the shoreline uh, and impacting their uh, quality of playing services too. Uh, particularly places like Maryland, uh, New Hampshire, Vermont, uh, certainly um, uh, Oregon and, and parts of California there. So, and it's not just the federal and state uh, legislation uh, or regulation, it's also this concept of a greener cultural attitude and awareness. And this is something that has uh, reached some of the marketing with um, uh, children's products. Uh, this is Stonyfield Organics and uh, their mission to uh, push uh, pesticide-free organic fields uh, for youth. Um, and this is something that, um, you know, when this happens in, in our culture, certainly um, this uh, continues to get pushed, pushed forward uh, and will continue to be a challenge in maintaining these uh, playing surfaces. But this is a problem, right? And it goes well beyond aesthetics. Uh, it's one thing turf grass is, is consistently uh, criticized for in terms of herbicide use, fertilizer use. Uh, but it, it's, a, it's a problem that goes beyond aesthetics because when we lose turf cover like this uh, and we know our weeds are less wear tolerant than our desirable grasses. Um, and when this happens, uh, we lose vegetative cover, surface hardness goes up drastically. Uh, we know we have increased risk of lower extremity injury, uh, increased risk of uh, concussions, and, and certainly uh, player safety. So putting some numbers to this, um, 300,000 concussions per year. Uh, that number is very similar for ACL injuries. Um, and of those concussions per year, 25% of them are related direct head to ground exposure. And this doesn't come uh, without a cost. So 2.6 million uh, ER visits from sports related injuries in youth sports, five to 24 years of age, and at a cost of two billion dollars for high school athletes alone. So as we look into the literature, uh, I can give uh, some indication of what's happened in relation to some of this research uh, related to pesticide free. Um, <clears throat> you know, you heard talks from Dr. Kaminsky, uh, from Clint, uh, in terms of some of these pesticide free alternatives that are not being a well accepted uh, option for many turf grass managers being challenges with some of those. You heard some of those. Uh, you know, some of the, the, the greatest herbicides we have that are organic are simply aggressive overseeding. Uh, you know, Clint talked about that ecology piece, um, and you know, we've seen some of our greatest weed reductions just by having that traffic and replacing it with desirable grasses. But we know our weeds are not as traffic tolerant, and the question becomes how can we take advantage of that? Uh, Dr. Dest uh, did some really cool work um, where he separated the two components of traffic. We have wear, we have the abrasion, bruising, removal of plant tissue, and then we have the compaction piece of traffic. He separated those two components of traffic and showed in his data that that wear piece, that, that abrasion, 
uh, removal of leaf tissue is more detrimental to a vegetative stand than compaction. So the question becomes, how do we take advantage of this? And this is uh, uh, our first prototype of the new device. Uh, we call it a weed bind, uh, basically pulling on that uh, component of removing those weeds selectively from a turf grass stand. And what we've done is basically modify a, a Toro Grounds Pro 2000, removed the reel, what would be the blades, and replaced that with a coarse textured brush, remove the, the uh, bed knife, and replace that with this <coughs> grooved base blade. There's a little bit closer picture. So as these bristles are interacting with this grooved base blade, uh, <coughs> our, our monocots, our desirable grasses, uh, are able to conform to that action. Any broadleaf type morphology that is wider, broader, more mass, is either badly damaged or removed. Um, so uh, we're taking advantage of that difference in morphology between those two plant types. All right. Um, you can see there's one pass with the, the prototype uh, in a stand of, of white clover, um, removing uh, much of that plant material. So I have a video uh, demonstrating the prototype here. It allows me to click on it. So as it moves through the stand, you can see it's selectively removing a lot of the weed tissue, plant tissue. So if, it's, if we're able to remove that leaf tissue that's obviously photosynthesizing actively, that puts that plant at a disadvantage. That plant has to use carbohydrate reserves to regenerate that growth. And within uh, another week, that may be regenerate. But again, we're doing it again, removing it again. And over time, we're putting that turf grass plant in a better competitive position. To, to uh, Clint's uh, note earlier about affecting that ecology of the stand over time. So one of the first studies that we did was look at uh, frequency of application. Uh, we call this a preliminary study. Uh, we looked at perennial ryegrass, uh, three inches or 7.6 centimeters height of cut, three replications in RCBD, and we simply looked at frequency of application of the weed bind. So one time a week, uh, basically in conjunction with mowing, so we do the weed bind treatment and then mow the plots. All right. We did that. Looked at that twice per week, uh, once every other week, or, or, or biweekly. Uh, compared that synthetic, synthetic herbicides and mowing and control. Uh, I won't share a lot of that data but because of time, but uh, one time per week was considered optimal in terms of allowing that weed to regenerate uh, those that weren't completely removed and take that tissue off again, put that plant at disadvantage again. So once we determined that frequency of application in terms of being optimal, we then looked at uh, overall efficacy. We did this on Kentucky bluegrass, uh, two reps here, uh, same design, and we looked at the weed bind once per week and then compared that to synthetic herbicides and a mow-only control. And this is the first data here, so we got the effect of mechanical and herbicidal uh, weed control methods on percentage of broadleaf and uh, broadleaf weed control in Poa pretensis here. So we did this over two years. Uh, uh, first year was uh, 14, 15, and 16. Uh, this is the second uh, iteration of the study or replication of the study. Um, I share this just because of, of time as an example here. Uh, so weed bind treatments were started uh, 20th of September, and these treatments, these plots, were basically unmanaged for uh, four years. So very high weed population, so you're talking 80, 90 percent weeds. Uh, we assessed weed uh, cover qualitatively, uh, did an analysis, and basically determined there were no differences between treatments when we initiated our treatments. Uh, and then once we initiated treatments and assessed those plots uh, qualitatively, we uh, used the uh, Henderson-Tilton uh, formula to uh, calculate percent control of that weed. So what you're looking at here uh, is weed control uh, one week after treatment, uh, essentially one treatment, October 5th, three treatments, October uh, 19th, uh, five treatments. 
So basically, initiating treatments in the fall, putting that plant at a disadvantage as it goes into dormancy, and initiating treatments again in the spring once it comes out of treatments uh, or out of dormancy. So uh, after the first treatment year, you see we can have 42% control compared to the herbicides of 77.6. Uh, by the October 5th, we're up to uh, about 63% control where the herbicides are up to 93. Um, and then by the uh, mid-October there, we're at 81% control, which is significantly different from the uh, herbicides. So not as effective as herbicides, but still significant reduction in uh, weed pressure there. Uh, as we come out of dormancy that subsequent spring, uh, that May 23rd is a first rating prior to treatment. So we have a little bit of weed recovery there, uh, control at only 66.5, uh, not significantly different than the herbicide there. Um, but by the time we get up to uh, the fourth treatment of that second year, uh, we're back up to 90% uh, control, uh, and it really doesn't go much uh, beyond that. Uh, we get up to 99% control by uh, November. But again, these are weekly treatments. Um, and just for consistency of the study, we treated weekly, but we likely could start laying off frequency um, by that third or fourth treatment, that subsequent spring. So just to give you an indication of some of the um, species that were in the study, so this is the first year looking at uh, treated, this is mechanically treated on the left here, uh, untreated control here. Um, and again, weed bind treatments and then mowing on the same day. Um, give you some indication of some of the eff efficacy on uh, dandelion there. Uh, this is uh, clover uh, in the foreground here. <clears throat> and this is uh, mechanically treated here on the top. Uh, and then the second iteration of the study, this, uh, we had more ground ivy pressure here, obviously significant. Uh, this is uh, mechanically treated up here on the top, uh, untreated control here. So uh, the conclusion of this work, uh, basically that the weed bind is showing uh, really good potential as effective uh, curative broadleaf weed control option in, in uh, Kentucky bluegrass and that's one application per week in a curative type mode. Um, and uh, the other piece is that um, this is not as definitive or uh, um, as fast as synthetic herbicides, uh, but nonetheless, with subsequent treatments, we can get um, pretty strong levels of control. Uh, the other piece to this, although we didn't look at that, I, I still think this machine can help a lot of folks in the pesticide-free realm, those that are under restrictions or choose not to use pesticides, but uh, I really think this can be utilized as a tool to, you know, once an area is treated with a synthetic herbicide and 100% control is achieved, um, they could use this as an IPM tool uh, once a month or every two months to keep uh, weed pressures acceptable or within a, a tolerable range. Because uh, in essence, regardless of your method of control, whether it's mechanical or chemical, uh, you know, the principles of weed control still remain. So the, the, the younger that weed is, the more susceptible it is, the more uh, likely you are to have complete control faster. Um, but again, more research is warranted on other turf grass species and weed species. So you saw um, perennial ryegrass we touched on, we touched on Kentucky bluegrass, uh, we touched on some of the uh, weed species that uh, it's effective on.